Ace Podcast. Hello and welcome to the first episode from season one of Vaguely Accurate, the science show where we're giving your research the media attention it deserves. I'm your host DK and today on the show we have Ashley Wolfe, a PhD candidate from Curtin University studying the urbanisation of reptiles. I hope you enjoy. Uh, my name is Ashley Wolfe, I'm a PhD candidate at Curtin University uh, studying the impacts of urbanisation on reptiles. My project title is Urban Ecology of Perth's Reptiles Using a Snake and Skink as Models. So my snake is the dugite, which yeah. is a brown snake, and my skink is the bobtail lizard. So you might know it as a shingleback. Um, and I chose those two species because they are both quite big. They're quite iconic. Everyone has a story about them. And uh, they appear to be the two best urban adapted reptiles, large reptiles that we have in Perth. But of course, they're so different. One's a venomous snake. And one is this harmless little lizard, but you don't want it to bite you because it hurts a lot. Um, and so people have these different ideas about them, but they're both persisting really, really well. So what is it about these two reptiles that make them such ideal reptiles to be living in the city? And then what can I learn about that and how can I use those things that I found that make them so successful to uh, have for conservation planning for the benefit of other reptiles, the smaller ones that are harder to catch, harder to find, but we know that they're there. Because we have 71 species of reptiles in Perth, but it's just so hard to keep track of them all. And even if you were to be trapping for two weeks in a row and checking every day, you wouldn't catch them all. But they're there. So what have you found so far are factors that would um, cause these ones to be so prevalent in the urban areas, I suppose? I think a lot of it is they're quite flexible behaviourally. Mm -hmm. uh, reptiles aren't very well known for being very behaviourally flexible, partially because they've got smaller brains than birds and mammals and they don't seem to be smart and they don't seem to have as many what we call innovations, where they do something new and something different. But if we start off with dugites, um, they seem to be habitat generalists. They, they can live anywhere. They're all across Perth. They're the most common snake that you come across in people's backyards. I'm also a volunteer snake catcher in my spare time, and I go out to call-outs, and I see snakes, and they are everywhere. Dugites mostly eat mice and lizards and living in the city, what more could you want? There's mice everywhere. If you have a bird aviary with the seed falling down onto the ground, the mice eat the seed, the snakes eat the mice. That's why they're often found in bird aviaries. Uh, also in messy, unkempt gardens where people don't rake the leaves, uh, it's a great place for them to hide and they can come in and out as they like, and they have lots of ways to get around as well. A dugite can climb a fence if it really, really wants to, but it prefers not to. They normally go for the cracks between the fences, and especially in Perth where we've got this big sprawl and we have little patches of urban vegetation just sort of scattered all over the place. Uh, you've got places like Bipper Lake, Herdsman Lake, Joondalup Lake, they're the really big patches, but then there's also small places. Some of them are as small as just one block between houses, and that can be enough to be suitable habitat for a snake. Have you found that, especially when you go out to catch them, but also during your research, are they quite an aggressive species? No. I think ag aggression is the wrong term to use for a snake. It's the same sort of misconception as saying that a snake is poisonous. Mm -hmm. The whole term with that is if I eat it and I die, it is poisonous. Yep. If it bites me and I die, it's venomous. Mm -hmm. So then the other idea is people think, well, that snakes are really aggressive. They can be quite defensive, 
There's a really great quote by a herpetologist called um, Alexander Pope, and it's, snakes are first of all cowards, then bluffers, and last of all warriors. So if a snake has any opportunity to run away from you, it will. Um, a lot of our snake species like to rely on crypsis, which is where they stay still and they pretend to be cryptic, which is hard to see. So brown snakes are really good because they look like sticks and they camouflage so well. So they often stay put. And that's one thing that I've, I saw just last week. I have a snake that I'm tracking and I found it and I saw her and she just sat still. And I, I watched her for about two minutes and I got quite close to her uh, within about 30 centimeters of her and she stayed still. And I actually had to, to nudge her with my snake hook very gently, just to make sure she was still okay. But she was holding her breath, being very, very, very still. She didn't want anything to do with me. So, does, does that come under the term of bluffers after that? That's, that's cowards. That's still cowards. Okay. Bluffers is when they rear up and they say, I'm going to bite you, I'm going to bite you. And often the snakes will lunge forward as if to bite you, but not actually bite because it takes energy to make venom and then if you were to bite something especially something that's bigger than you is it worth it and 50 percent of dugite bites are actually what we call dry bites which means that there is no venom involved and that's a bluff there even if it connects with you it doesn't inject venom that's that's trying to say okay i've warned you now i'm going to bite you back off uh, but you can never be sure if it if it's an envenomated bite or not. So you always have to treat it as if there was venom. Um, so that's that's bluffers when they pretend to bite you, and it's it's like someone throwing a fake punch at you. And then last of all is warriors, when you've got the snake by the tail and it it can't let go. You you can't get rid of it. It wants to get away from you. And that's the last call. I have to bite you to leave me alone. And that's when, where a lot of snake bites come from. It's a here, hold my beer situation. You go pick it up. The snake's not happy. And the snake will bite someone so that that person lets it go so that it can get away. So this is where the misconception, especially from like any listeners that aren't in Australia, everyone thinks Australia is... Like, almost like a big danger pit of reptiles, I suppose. Yes, but I would say that so long as you, you treat a snake like you would someone's dog, yep. if you don't know what its temperament is like, it's better to leave sleeping dogs lie. Don't go near it and don't provoke it. 90% of snake bites in Australia are to do with someone who's picked up a snake either by trying to catch it or trying to kill it. Mm -hmm. So we're the instigators, not the snakes. Quite often, you know, <laughs> And then even other people who get bitten by snakes uh, who don't realise. So we had earlier in the year a lady um, was bitten by a tiger snake. She was on a school excursion and the snake was right next to her and the snake was rearing up trying to say, hey, get away from me, get away from me, but she didn't see it. The snake doesn't know that we're not watching them. And once the snake had given her enough time, I'm assuming, then it bit her. It doesn't, a snake doesn't just go, oh, a human bite, because we're frightening. We're really frightening. We're really big, I suppose. Yes, we are. Absolutely. With tiger snakes, um, they're, for me personally, and I'm not from Australia, as you probably tell, like, I've been told by most Australians that they tend to be, they chase you, is what is a rumour, at least, that goes about how true, it, with the bluffing mm -hmm. um, approach that they take, is that bluffed? Are they, are they being, is that actually a thing that people will experience, or is that just something that's become more of an urban legend, I suppose? I've never been chased by a snake. I have released many snakes where the snake wanted to go in my direction because I was standing between it and where it wanted to go. And it was coming towards me. I realized that. So I took a step to the side and the snake went right past me. The only time when the snake has ever actually uh, 
feigned a strike towards me is when it's sit- sitting there and I want this snake to move on because the last thing you want to do is release an animal and then have it sit there for a while and then a predator come and get it. So I like to make sure that the animal is moved on and that's when I walk up towards it and then it says, hey, give me time, and it comes up, it raises its head up. But I've never been chased. A lot of people think that tiger snakes are quite aggressive. I call them quite grumpy. There's a lot of similarities. I can understand how people can get confused. They don't like being touched and if they want to go a certain way and you're in the way, and you're trying to coax it a different way, no, they want to go that way for whatever reason it might be. And often people don't realise that, and so they think that they're being chased, yeah. With the population density of, I suppose, like you guys in the bog towels, and they are quite open, like I found many in my backyard, especially in my new house, which is very, I suppose, it's got very a lot of natural foliage going on in there. Um, Actually, I witnessed one do that whole kind of, stun and stare mm-hmm. kind of approach um are they a lot more common especially do guy do guys which i've not actually seen are they a lot more common than you think they're just like you said very shy and high yes so one researcher um in sydney had a look at eastern brown snakes so they are the scientific name for those is pseudonaja textilis I'm looking at Pseudonaja affinis. So same genus, different species. Okay. So they are related to each other. And the people who went out there are very, very good at working with snakes. They've got years and years of experience. They went out and they had trackers on a whole bunch of snakes. And they followed the trackers and they knew where the snakes were because the computer was telling them the snake is within 10 centimetres of you north direction. And they couldn't see them. And I find that as well. I know where a snake is and I can't see it. So they propose that for every snake you see, there's nine you don't. Wow. So they're almost experts in hide and seek, I suppose. Especially when they're underground too. Because lots of snakes spend time underground or under leaves, in bushes. Do they burrow themselves or do they usually find empty burrows from other animals or just man-made structures that they kind of hide on themselves under they don't burrow themselves they find natural crevices and cracks and they will use another animal's burrow do you guys particularly like going down mouse holes because there's a free meal in there too and i found that a dugai has eaten a whole nest of mice 10 mice in one go mother and nine little babies all in one go how often do i suppose in themselves do you guys actually eat it depends on the weather Mm-hmm. When they're warm, they eat more often. When it's cold, they don't want to eat because they're ectothermic or what people will refer to as cold-blooded. Yeah. So when it's cold, they're cold. And when they're cold, their metabolism is very, very slow, so they don't want to eat. And when it warms up, they eat a lot. They, they probably eat once a week. Okay. And when you have a big meal, you can metabolize it uh, very fast if you're warm or very slow if you're cold. So it all depends on that. With um, the old snake calling and snake catching, mm-hmm. one, how did you get into that? And two, have you got any, I suppose, really good stories that was a common scenario, I suppose? Um, I got into it because I'm doing snake research okay. and one of the things I'm doing is tracking snakes. So if you find a snake in your backyard and you have a snake catcher come and move it, does the snake come back? Mm-hmm. Is it territorial? Does it know where to come back? And... One of the really useful ways of getting snakes is by being a snake catcher, going out to those calls and finding the really useful animal. It's a lot better than relying on other people when you can do it yourself. Yeah. Also, working with dugites, I think it's great to have as much experience hands-on as I can. Um, I'm able to use the tools and I don't get really nervous when I'm working with them. Yeah. A lot more experience, I suppose. I suppose taking away the nerves when you're especially you're doing research with them themselves takes away that whole extra worry. Yes. Let alone worrying about the data and collecting everything. Yes, if I learn how the snakes act when I do this and how they act when I do that, then I know the best way to keep the snakes calm, keep me calm, keep my research assistants calm. Yeah. Yeah. Also I just I think it's nice for the peace of mind to help someone out when they're terrified of a snake being in their backyard and I can just move it along and they see me. Um, 
I know this is a podcast and no one can see me, yeah. but um, I'm 25. <laughs> uh, I have bright red hair <laughs> and people come up and say, you, you're catching snakes. Oh, well, I shouldn't feel very worried then anymore because if someone like you can do it, then someone like me shouldn't be <laughs> so scared standing in the corner, says the 50-something-year-old man. It's almost like a snake role model for snakes, <laughs> I suppose. I, th- I think that anyone who's afraid of snakes should see me yeah. and then just sort of think, oh, maybe it's it's not for blokes. I'm, all like, I'm feeling a lot more confident about the whole thing now. Um, <laughs> um, you want a snake story? Yes, please. Um, I often get call-outs for things that are not snakes. Yeah. Um, rubber rubber flip-flop thong shoes <laughs> that, are, that are snakes. Um, I, I, I had a lady who called me up petrified that there was a snake in her backyard and I went and she said, okay, go look. And she's got a quarter of an acre block and she just, go look. And when I, I gave it 20 minutes and, and had a look and couldn't find anything and her gardener was there and he said, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm looking for the snake. A snake? It was here yesterday. And the lady says, no, it was here today. And he looked at her and said, no, the snake was here yesterday. You're wasting this young girl's time. (laughs) And then we have one lady who lives on the edge of a lake and she's had three tiger snakes in her house. And every time it's been a tiger snake in her house as well. And now she's at the point where I've actually shown her how to shoo the snake out of her house. (laughs) So she doesn't have to keep calling me. That's an awesome skill to have. Yeah. One thing I've noticed that I almost made the same mistake was with little legless lizards. I wasn't, I was in the living room, lights were off, mm-hmm. and my dog was just staring at something. I turned it on, I just saw this thing run under the sofa. I was like, it's always better to assume that it is a snake if you're not sure. Don't be embarrassed. I've done a few call outs for legless lizards, and I go, it's not a snake, go to pick it up straight away, and people are freaking out. <laughs> but I've done a call out to one place which had a legless lizard, and I told them that. It's very good that they called me because it's better to be safe than sorry. And they did everything right, got the animals into the house, got children into the house, yeah. treated it as if it were a snake. A month later, I got a call to the same place and it was a dew guy. Oh, okay. So just because it's not a snake this time, it could be a snake next time. And is it a free service? I suppose it's called out service. Yeah, it's volunteer based. Yep. Uh, I ask for donations. Um, sometimes people don't pay me anything and that's fine because... Mm-hmm. I do it as a volunteer. Yeah. Sometimes people give me some money towards petrol, yeah. and that's very good as well. But uh, there's this this growing idea that um, it's great if you have a snake and it's easy to catch it. Yeah. But if someone makes you go searching someone's backyard for an hour and don't come up with anything, you've provided them with a the service there. And at least a thank you very much, I appreciate it, is something that... Um, we like and there's a lot of people who do this we um donate our time essentially i could get a call right now and i'd be off uh helping someone out with that and uh, it's it's just common courtesy for everyone it's it's not it's not a service that's just provided that you should expect to have because we go through this training and um, we love what we do so I, I prefer to catch the snake so I can show someone a little bit about the snake and I've got this ex, this extra uh, angle that I can go because I look, I'm researching these snakes and I can tell you about if I re- uh, release this, it's not going to come back. Don't worry. I know. I'm researching it. What do they eat? Well, I've been looking at that too. That's amazing. Yeah. So this would be a really good segue to kind of move into your research itself. Mm-hmm. So. You've told us at the beginning what you are and the title of your project. Mm-hmm. So why are you researching this is always a good, important question, especially. Because I love reptiles. I think, it, I think that they're really awesome. And I, when I was in my undergraduate uh, doing environmental biology at Curtin University, yeah. I had an opportunity to do work experience. And so I did some work experience at our local reptile centre where I spent a whole lot of time just cleaning out enclosures and feeding animals. But it was just really cool being in that sort of environment with the reptiles and people always asking me questions and I'm forwarding those questions on to the people who know a little bit more and I think, wow, it would be really cool to know a little bit more about these animals. Hmm. Then when it came to the time to either 
uh, look for a job or do a PhD. I couldn't find a job, so I wanted to do the PhD. And I said I'd really love to work with snakes because I'd love to learn a little bit more about them. And then my supervisor, Dr. Bill Bateman, uh, he was new at the time, and he said, well, I've always been interested in urban snakes, but I've never had anyone who wanted to do the project because they're venomous snakes. And I said, I'm your girl. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And so I started reading about it, and there's just so much we don't know about urban reptiles because they are living around the city, but what happens if someone demolishes a block? Where do the snakes go? What happens if that we have climate change impacting temperatures or rainfall, and especially with them being ectothermic, relying on the outside temperature. And all of these different things with people having lots of dogs, what about cats, what about if you find a snake in your backyard. So I sort of did a bit of research and thought, realised we don't know anything. We have to start from the beginning. And so I set out these main questions, which are, um, and so the only way to really find out about how reptiles are doing well in the city is to also compare them to snakes and uh, lizards outside of the city. So on the basis of that, I'm comparing snakes in Perth, Western Australia, and snakes outside of uh, Perth city proper, so more into the regional areas. And so I'm looking at, is there a difference in what they eat? Is there a difference in how they move and where they go? And is there a difference in how they respond to people? And then, so that's the sort of animal side of things. And I'm also doing a little bit of human psychology sort of thing by looking at, what about people in and out of the city? How do they respond to these reptiles as well? So what do they eat? I'm doing diet analysis studies uh, where I'm dissecting a whole bunch of museum specimens and also roadkill that I pick up. And that's been really, really interesting. I I think that a dissection is, to quote Forrest Gump, just like a box of chocolates. (laughs) You never know what you're going to get. I've gotten everything from mice to other snakes and inside of bobtails I found a uh, roast chicken dinner with chicken bones and aroma tomato and some lettuce and I found a dog poo <laughs> inside of a bobtail. Wow. Just oh. everything, glass, all sorts of stuff, centipede legs, crazy. They eat absolutely everything. They eat everything. Is that just relating to snakes or bobtails themselves? Uh, the, or... the bobtails are eating the dog poos the bobtails and are the, the stuff. with the odd taste buds there. Yeah, they just eat anything. Um, whereas the snakes, it's lizards, mice and other snakes yeah. as well. Um, for the movement uh, research, I'm the first person in the world to GPS track a snake. Congratulations. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I fell into it accidentally. (laughs) I was reading literature and looking at what has been done previously and I fell upon um, a paper from the 90s by Koifi and Chalazzi. I may have said that incorrectly. (laughs) And... um, where they externally attached a VHF tracker. So a VHF is very high frequency. Um, you have a receiver and it sends out ping, ping, mm-hmm. ping, like Marco Polo. The closer you get to it, the louder the ping. And that's how you can find your animal. So they had that externally attached to a snake's tail. And I thought, that's awesome. And I spoke to a whole bunch of different distributors for trackers. And they said, you know, no one's ever done this with GPS before. And I said, really? Because I read VHF and I thought GPS as well. And so when I was had already committed to doing it, I realized, wait a minute, they only they only did the basic standard radio tracking. And I'm adding GPS and no one's done that before. Oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself <laughs> into? <laughs> I have three snakes out right now with GPS trackers. One snake, no GPS points because she's all always undercover and so she doesn't have good visibility with the sky okay. but when I find her I, I know where she is whereas I've got another snake 
and she comes out right into the sunshine. And so I've got GPS points and where she, when she comes out is directly related to how hot the day was. If it's a cooler day, she's out in the morning. If it's a hot day, she's out in the afternoon. And that's really, really interesting. Um, last year I did this with seven translocated snakes. So these are snakes caught from people's backyards and moved away. Mm -hmm. And all the snakes, they just moved all over the place. It was crazy. One snake was crossing roads all the time and eventually got struck by a car. Yeah, and other snakes being eaten by monitor lizards, snake eaten by a fox, snake eaten by a bird. And so these snakes that I'm tracking right now are really interesting because they're ones that I found in the wild yeah. that I caught them where they're from and I put them back exactly where they came from and they're still there and they have these really small little spaces that they like to stay in. So you've got bold snakes and snakes that just prefer to just stay in one place. They found their niche, they found where they like to live, and they don't move as much as the ones that go all over the place and end up in people's backyards. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they really do have their own individual personalities. Absolutely, they definitely do. And there's this whole complex of uh, bold versus shy animals. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily call the snakes that stay in one place as shy because they do come out a lot. Mm. It's just they're happy where they live. Have you tried doing this with um, bobtail lizards? Yes, and it's so much easier because bobtails are bigger. Yeah. And when you put trackers on them, they don't fall off. Okay. And you can have a bigger tracker in general. And they don't go underground so much. And when they do... At least if the tracker falls off, you can go and retrieve it quite easily and just go find another bobtail. But with snakes, you have to be really careful because you really want to make sure that if you touch the snake, it's because you absolutely have to. Whereas a bobtail, if, if a bobtail bites you, it yeah. just hurts. You're not straight to the hospital. Yeah, exactly. And they're much slower and much easier to grab as yeah. well. So the bobtails are a lot easier to track. And... I've, one of my most interesting ones is I've tracked a male and a female breeding pair. Oh, wow. So bobtail's really interesting. They're quite solitary animals, but in springtime they come together. Yep. And the male follows the female around. They breed, and then the boy just buggers off. <laughs> <laughs> and then the female sort of doesn't do as much. She incubates um, her babies. Yep. And then she gives birth to live baby bobtails. They give birth to live bobtails? Yes, they so do. So reptiles aren't all egg, I suppose? No. They don't all reproduce and intake. Well, there's three Breeding different eggs. kinds. You've got the egg layers, you've got the ones that have eggs internally, and then the eggs hatch inside of mum and they give birth. Oh, wow. So it's not a hard egg surface. Think of it soft like a frog egg. So it's but almost it's like a mucous membrane. But yeah. It's just a bit tougher. I and suppose. that's what bobtails are like. They actually have eggs with yolk inside of the mother yep. and then the mother gives birth to the live baby. And then you've got ones which have full umbilical cord. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're almost like the same way the mammals, I suppose. Yeah, very, day. very similar. I had no idea. That. Do you guys lay eggs and bobtails yeah. give birth to live young with eggs inside of them? So what about the third question you posed? Uh, looking at people and yeah. reptiles. So the first part of it is, are snakes aggressive? Do they attack people? So whenever I go and I find a snake or a bobtail, I sort of stand next to it and I wait 30 seconds and I observe. So what does it do at the moment I come up to it? And I'm within one or two metres of the animal. Snakes I don't do this for, but bobtails I give them a tap on the head as well to see if they will, if they don't do anything and then I tap them on the head, do they then react? Yeah. Uh, snake's obvious reason, I don't want to get bitten to do that. <laughs> That's very dangerous. And the snakes either stay still or slither away, whereas bobtails, depending on what temperature they are, will either stay still, run away, or open their mouth and put out their beautiful, iconic blue tongue and hiss at you. And so I think if they're colder, they're more likely to try and hiss. Yeah. And if they're warmer, they run. Like once again, because of their metabolism, if they're warm, they've got a better metabolism so they can run. Whereas if you're colder, it's easier to just sit 
conserve your energy and just open your mouth and hope that you've scared it away because they've got this UV re light reflecting and some animals see things in different lights to us and that blue is very frightening, very startling to other animals. Wow. So that's why they open up their big blue tongue. Yeah. And then the other side of it is how do people respond. And one thing I'm doing is putting rubber snakes on the side of the road and seeing if people hit them. <laughs> people hit them? Yes. As in deliberately swerve yes. to take them out? I don't use the word swerve. Sorry. Because uh, that would imply that someone is doing risky driving behavior. And you should okay. never swerve for an animal, either to hit or to miss. Okay. Because most fatality as a result of hitting an animal is because of the swerving the car into a tree but some people <clears throat> will see a snake or a lizard on the side of the road and will take the time to line it up and go over it and it, it just takes a, a couple of degrees in of angle shift and then they just go over it and some people a good, any snake uh is the saying is a good snake is a dead snake and they don't care about its wildlife. They don't care that it's illegal to kill any kind of wildlife and they just think that snakes should die because they're awful. It's lack of education, I suppose? Yes. They're afraid of them. They're afraid that they'll get bitten by them and there are some people who I can't even say the word snake to without them trembling. I, some of my labs, they won't go into the whole entire building if they know that I have a snake in there. Really? Really. I have, that is a occupational health and safety issue that I have to worry about. I have to let the lab manager know that I will have a snake in. So when you have a live snake in the building, it's obviously not for the dissecting approach. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what are you looking at when you've got a live snake in there? That's normally when I'm putting a GPS tracker on them. So you actually bring them in for... I have to do that because I have... Um, some veterinary, <clears throat> excuse me, I have some veterinary equipment that I need to use. So attaching a snake tracker, I have to make a couple of incisions with needles. Okay. And so then I have to give them a local anesthetic. Okay. And, and so that can't be done in the field, it has to be done here. How do the ethics come about with, I suppose, attaching a GPS tracker if you are penetrating a snake, I suppose? It was pretty good because I did my research. Mm -hmm. I spoke to a lot of people and I practiced a lot on dead snakes. Okay. So I knew I got it right. That's the good thing about having lots of dead snakes. <laughs> they don't flinch and you can get it wrong and you know you haven't hurt it. And so I got it, get it right the first time. And I always have some people with me who are experienced um, and I'm never by myself. And I have... Um, lots of vet advice as well so it's a very very minor procedure it's like having your ear pierced but recently I've had snakes in another lab because we've been um, I've just secured um, some money to do some research on snake repellents oh, wow. to see if snake repellents work or not so you got a commercial approach coming it's, on into this, I suppose. It's from local government. That's fantastic. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Especially achieving extra funding in this yeah. climate. There must be something special about it. Yeah, and nobody has actually done any real research on snake repellents in Australia. But we're looking at the snake repellents to see if uh, I've got six different, four different repellents mm -hmm. and seeing if, if they're actually working. Uh, and so to see if the snakes respond to them and if they're given two paths and one path has a repellent and the other path has no repellent, does it actively avoid the repellent path? So it's almost a very simple binary experiment. Yes. Yes, no. Yes. And so we have starting up soon um, extra choice experiments where they're in an arena and there are two hides. So they're completely exposed and so an exposed snake wants to go hide. Yes. And one hide is blocked off by a repellent and one is not will it cross the repellent line to go hide or not because if a snake crosses the line that repellent doesn't work yeah um so that's really interesting and we're going to have that finished by the end of the year my personal opinion is they don't work and from what i've seen so far they don't work um one of the last questions i want to ask have there been any limitations that you found during your research so Maybe a lack of experience and something's gone wrong or funding, have you felt? 
I mean, you've just got more funding, so that must be going all right, I suppose. But any areas like that that have hindered yourself? I've had lots of things go wrong. That's the problem <laughs> with working with seasonally dependent animals yeah. is that, well, if all your equipment isn't there when the weather is right, you can't do the work. True. One, one of the biggest limitations I've had this year is Perth had an unseasonably cold September. And I wanted to be out in September, but I could only start working in October. So I've essentially lost a month worth of field work because the weather was no good. It was too cold. There were no snakes. How are you supposed to track snakes if there are no snakes out because they're all sleeping because it's too cold? And equipment arriving too late. Uh, Some of my trackers failed last year because water got into them and fried a circuit board. But... I think one of those skills you learn in a PhD is to be able to pick up the pieces and work on the fly and just sometimes duct tape works or sometimes if you're missing something and but you've got a pocket knife and the pocket knife can do quite easily what some sophisticated piece of, of equipment does anyway and it's just that ingenuity and ability to not break down and start crying when things don't work. I think it's great for the real world because you're going to be um, put into stressful situations. And even if there's absolutely nothing you can do, just take a calm, deep breath and take it one day at a time. And things go over time. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And other things take priority too. Things happen in your life. You have deaths in the family or you get really, really sick. Um, that's one of my issues. I actually have a disability. Okay. Uh, I have fibromyalgia, which is a nervous system disorder and where my uh, body gets really, really sore for no reason at all. And it can uh, give me some issues with walking. Uh, and I've got scar tissue on one of my lungs from a hole in a lung oh, wow. that just randomly happened. And so I can't get my heart rate up too high. So I need a lot of help with heavy lifting and walking long distances, but I just pace myself. I take my own time. My doctor thinks I'm crazy doing a PhD, let alone a PhD in the field with snakes because if you get a hairy situation, your heart rate goes really high. (laughs) So I suppose the extra training with snake handling has got a double benefit there, just being able to breathe calm with a scenario, know the situation and how to handle it. Exactly. And... Even through all of the days where I just been wiped out and couldn't do everything that I needed to do and feeling really bad, I've still accomplished so much and I will get there. And I think that's the best. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, Last question I'd like to ask is, do you have any um, plans? What do you plan to do, I suppose, after this? Are you going into industry? Do you want to go into a postdoc position? I'm... Two and a half years, mm-hmm. I've just gone down to part-time. Okay. I'm supposed to be finished in July 2017. Okay, so coming up very yeah. soon, I suppose. Very soon. Very soon. <laughs> I've actually started collaborating with other universities with research around snakes and bobtails. Oh, wow. I've just started working with Murdoch University uh, as part of a bobtail flu research program because a lot of the bobtails that I come across... They're sick and they look like they have the flu. They have snotty nose and bubbly eyes and they're not eating anything. And so working with local wildlife rehabilitation centres, I've been really interested in this and trying to push for someone to do this research. And finally, um, some great vets at Murdoch University have started looking at bobtail flu and the rehab centre's saying, oh, you have to get Ashley in on this. So um, I'm starting... Uh, looking at doing some tracking of post-release bobtails after they've been supposedly uh, rehabilitated from the flu. Um, And that's one potential thing that's on there. I might be doing some other stuff with other universities, just looking at reptiles across the city, what's around, what is good for them. So looking at gardens and smaller lizards as well. Uh, I think I just have a lot of questions that I want answered and the only way I can do it is by just doing it. That's fantastic though, having something after already lined up, especially with so many ideas and so much support, I suppose. I don't know if there's any money involved in it, but we'll find a way. (laughs)
<laughs> as is the case with most science research or so yeah I suppose but if you can get a grant for the research then so long as it's enough for me to pay my bills I'm happy I'm not in it to make millions and millions of dollars yeah I just love working with these animals that's fantastic to hear thank you very much for taking the time out to come down again um is there anything else you'd like to add I suppose my number one goal out of this is education if Everyone who hears about my research just learns a little bit more about snakes and knows that if you come across a snake and you don't know if it's dangerous or not, leave it alone. Yeah. That could save lives. Of course, yeah. I, th I think that's just so much better for your self-esteem and your, um, your self-confidence as well to know that you can go out for a walk in the bush and if you see a snake, you know what to do. Just leave it alone, step away. If it's coming towards you, step in a slightly different direction and it'll yeah. move along. And just for the safety of people and for the safety of the snakes because we don't want them dying unnecessarily. They keep our rat populations down in the city. They're really, really important and they're just misunderstood animals. Hello again everyone and thank you very much for joining us. That was Ashley Wolf. I hope you learned something new. I know I certainly did. Uh, I would like to say if you enjoyed the show, please like us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and check out our website where we'll be posting regular articles on all things science. If you'd like to get involved with the show or even just send our feedback, please contact us. We encourage you to. You can contact us via our website from the Facebook page or you can email us at vaguecomments at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and I hope you enjoy our next show. Like dog poo smells bad one way, but once it passes through a second time, it's not very bad.